And it's nice to be back with Oregon. Always fun. And uh, apparently a little pop in from Kansas. Hi, Emily. Glad to have you here. Uh, Amanda is going to share slides so that I can keep an eye on the chat, one eye on the chat while I'm uh, talking. I'm absolutely open to you popping questions into the chat. Um, if it's something that really relates to what we're talking about right that minute, we'll address it right then. If not, we'll hold it until kind of an official Q&A section at the end. But I'm absolutely fine with, um, if we hit upon a topic that people want to contribute to and you pop a question in the chat, we can talk about it right then. Uh, you can also raise your hand. No, you know what? I can't, I'm not gonna be able to see you raise your hand while the slides are running, um, but it, pop it in the chat and we'll acknowledge you. And if it's something that you really want to, physically chat about I'm happy to you know have you unmute and we can we can have a little dialogue as well so uh, if you've been here with me before uh, you know who I am if not I'm Kat Fields White as Amanda said I'm um, founder of Farmers Market Pros we do a weekly podcast called Tent Talk we're at our 265th episode it's been going on for a really long time um, more than five years you would think that we would run out of topics by now but we most certainly have not Farmers markets have a lot to think about and talk about. Uh, we also host an annual conference, the Intense Conference. Get it, Intense. Uh, that's in March of every year. It's coming up uh, March 2024 on, I think, the 4th, 5th, and 6th. I could be wrong about that. It could be the 3rd, 4th, and 5th. You can find out at FarmersMarketPros.com. That's a wonderful gathering of farmers market participants. It started as managers, uh, farmers, and food vendors. As it's evolved, that particular gathering tends to be almost all market managers, operators, and staff. Um, so all of us gather in San Diego, have a good time. That's also available online. We live stream it so that can save you a little bit in travel costs, but it, it's really fun to be in the room if you can make it that way. We have a very vibrant uh, online community on Facebook, and you're welcome to join that as long as you answer the three qualifying questions. When we get to the end of this presentation, I'll drop that link in the box. Uh, and then we do consulting with various organizations, uh, farmers markets, startups, bigger markets that are that need uh, feasibility and revision, and also a lot of associations that are like this one, Oregon Farmers Market Association, that provide education to all of you as a group. Uh, I started 15 years ago as a farmers market manager. I started a market in my neighborhood because we had lots of restaurants and no grocery stores, and it's grown to be a very large market. It's the largest market in San Diego County. I've opened a number of other markets, some of which have transitioned to um, the business improvement agencies that we partnered with, some of which are still operating either under our management or others, and uh, some that have opened and then closed. And that's what this presentation is about today. Uh, we're going to talk about can this market be saved? If you have a struggling market, are you struggling because that's just the point that you're in in terms of a market evolution? Or is there something that you can be doing differently? Or at the end of the day, is this a market that was just not at the right time and place in the world and it's uh, it's better to close it. So we're gonna take it all away from kind of analyzing what's going on if you've got a market that doesn't feel vibrant, that doesn't seem to be growing or thriving, uh, and then what kind of decisions you can make on where you wanna go from there. So let's switch to the next slide, Amanda. So opening day at new markets are almost always busy. If you've done any kind of marketing to let people know that your market is coming. There is nothing that makes people happier than a brand new farmer's market in their neighborhood. The farmers and the vendors are chipper. Those tables are full. If you've chosen your opening day right, I would not recommend starting a new market the 1st of December in most climates, so maybe Texas. Um, but so you want to do it in the spring when tables can be really abundant. And there's always a ton of excitement. People in general are excited by new things. We love to go out to the newest restaurant or the newest activity or the, the newest farmer's market, especially if it's in our neighborhood. So you can almost always count on the first day of your market being busy. And what we try to teach people, uh, farmers, vendors, and new market operators, is to be prepared because generally speaking, the second market is not. You will oftentimes see a beautiful, really big, bustling market. Those aisles are full on the first day. And by the second market, you have dropped to very little. You're not in people's routines yet. You're not the brand new kid on the block. You're not the event of the week. Um, and then from there, you're going to start at the bottom and gradually build. And that's just very typical in market evolution. So we try to caution people about that so that they don't get worried. People that are at a brand new market that see it's so busy and then the next week it's 
kind of quiet. You've got people drifting through. You might have a few return people. You've got some folks that missed it the first week. You've got some folks there, but it's not going to be like opening day. So we try to caution people about that. And then there tends to be a gradual increase over the next three to 10, 18, 24 weeks until you've got a really strong base of loyal customers, plus the new people that you're adding from time to time, and you feel like you've got stability under your belt. But it's very, very natural that you have a drop after the first day of a market slide. So you want to be prepared for um, what happens on week two when you've got a significant drop off from week one. That doesn't mean you have a struggling market. That means you have a new market. Um, same on three, hopefully three is at least as good as two, maybe a little bit better by 10, you should be seeing an increase. You should be seeing more farmers and vendors. If you're actively recruiting throughout your season, you definitely should be seeing more customers. You should be seeing repeat customers, which is one of your key metrics. Uh, and you should be just feeling some vibrancy. Your farmers and vendors should be bringing in enough income to keep them going. It's very important to caution them going into a new market that it's going to take a while for them to see that. They may have to invest some lost days in that first run of weeks until things get started. Way less than they would if they were opening a brick or mortar business. If you open a brand new restaurant or a brand new retail shop, most advice is that you have enough reserve in the bank to carry you through for the first six months to 12 months used to be two years. I think people are in and out of businesses in general faster than they used to be, but you can predictably not show a profit for up to a year in a brick and mortar business. Farmers markets are usually a little faster than that. The overhead's a little bit lower, word spreads faster. It's such a niche thing. You've got such a targeted market that it shouldn't take you that long to achieve profitability, but it's going to take a little while. This is a new business. New businesses struggle. New businesses have the challenge of building a loyal customer base and a repeat traffic pattern. So that is something to be predictable about. If you're in week 10 and your market is not particularly busy, I would not regard you as a struggling market. I would regard you as a new market, that it's in a natural pattern of evolution. So knowing where you are in that growth pattern is going to affect how you react to metrics and numbers and things that you're watching to see if you're succeeding or not, to see if you've got a market that's stable, that's going to hang on for the long term. So early on, hang in there. It's just going to take time. Next slide, Amanda. So bigger actually isn't always better. And the fact that you're not a big market doesn't necessarily mean that you're a struggling market. There are many really stable markets that are small. We have a, a really popular market. I'm in Philadelphia right now. I'm halftime in Philadelphia, halftime in San Diego. We have a very popular market here that has 12 tents at it, and that's fine. They've got the basics that you need from a market. People don't buy their eggs anywhere else. The vendors and farmers are happy. They make money every week coming out. The market has figured out how to make it manageable financially for them to run a market that size. I will say that's tricky. If you're under 30 booths, oftentimes it's tricky for the market itself to show a net unless you're subsidized by sponsorships and other forms of income, but they've figured out a way to make it do it. So stability is great. If you're not shrinking in terms of activity and vendor sales and farmer sales and how many folks are showing up at your market, you're good. Stability is fine. Growing can also be a legitimate goal. A lot of folks go into this thinking they'll start with a relatively small market and then grow from there. And that will work. If you're looking for a really big market, my recommendation is always that you make sure you've got a critical mass size before you start. Because the that first impression of the first one or three or 10 weeks, when people see a very small market, in their heads, that's a small market. And it's going to take you years to get over that. So if you at a all can recruit enough vendors to start with a little larger critical mass if your goal is a large market. Um, that's our recommendation for sure. So the key questions here is when are changing changes happening at your market? If you believe you're struggling, if you've got less farmers and vendors than you used to, if you seem to have less customers, knowing when that's happening will tell you, do you really have a struggle on your hands or are you just in a natural evolutionary pattern? So if it's still very early, you're good if you're stable. If it's 10 weeks, 12 weeks, 16 weeks in, and you're shrinking, you're not holding stability, that's a concern. If you're stable and you're a year in and your goal is to have a larger market, 
you are also struggling and you're going to need to analyze some things to change that. You're not going to grow a big market if you haven't started growing by the time you get to that stage. Um, so what are the measures of whether a market's succeeding or struggling? Next slide, Amanda. I mean, there's some basic metrics that you look at to decide whether you're growing, whether you're succeeding, whether there's concerns that you need to address. So farmer and vendor income is number one. Some people will say number of farmers is number one, but that's not really it if your farmers and vendors are successful. So you, again, can have a very small, very stable market with just enough farmers and vendors to supply people's needs, enough um, stall income to make the market itself at least break even or, or profitable, unless you have a strong subsidy from sponsors or an association or a nonprofit that is hosting you as a market. Um, but as long as those farmers and vendors are seeing the sales and the income that they need and expect, you don't have a struggling market. You, you've got an okay market, that's good. Uh, shopper count is your other question. Obviously, for people to generate enough sales, you've got to have enough shoppers there. And for it to make sense for you to take up space in the world and in your neighborhood, uh, you need a certain amount of shoppers that are coming out to get to know you, get to know your farmers and vendors, obtain that nutritionally dense food, find the community gathering spot that they're hoping for. So if your shopper count is not at least staying stable over time, um, that's a metric that you wanna watch and decide whether or not you're succeeding in your mission or whether you're struggling and need to analyze some things. And then the market's own income, again, unless you're heavily subsidized, if you, you may have a mission-driven market that knows going in that it's not gonna be able to support itself financially, and that's okay if you know that going in, but most markets in this day and age I'm finding need to be financially uh, self-supporting. So whether that's from stall income versus staffing permit insurance, possible space uh, site rent overhead, if those things are not balancing out and you've got a loss at the end of the month, um, that's going to be a problem that you're going to need to address at some point, unless you are a subsidized market that's there for a specific reason, nutrition incentive vehicle, um, community gathering, activation of a business district, unless you're there for a specific reason and somebody's funding you to be there for those reasons, your market income, your net at the end of the month is also a sign of whether or not you're succeeding or struggling. So the metrics that you want to keep track of, um, next slide, Amanda, is your farmer and vendor count. Um, presumably that's at least staying stable or it's growing if you're a market that's relatively new and you're moving along. And all of these things also apply if you're a market that's two years old or four years old that has suddenly felt a shift. So these are the metrics that you wanna be watching. Are your farmer and vendor counts staying at least stable, if not growing? That's important. Are your farmer and vendor counts staying stable because you're constantly replacing farmers and vendors? That's okay. For the short term, in the long term, that's a sign of trouble. So you want to make sure that you've got retained vendors and farmers. If your farmers and vendors are leaving, they're leaving because the sales are not supporting them being there. Unless you've got a, a really old farmer and vendor base that's possibly retiring, aging out, getting out of the business, retained vendors is important. You want to make sure that people are coming back. That tells you that it's working for them. Your vendor sales income is sometimes hard to gauge. Some markets work on a percentage basis. And if you um, want to drop into the chat, whether your percentage or flat rate, that can be something that sort of informs that discussion. Vendor sales income, you want to keep track of, even if it's not on a regular uh, report your income every week, pay a percentage rent or not. You want to know what they're doing. So whether you get that anecdotally by asking them, how are sales? Are you up or down? That's always a good question. How are sales is a little rough sometimes. If you've got somebody that's uh, got kind of a negative mindset, they're always not as good as they could be. If you've got somebody that's a positive mindset, they could say, yeah, even though they're not really counting up what they're selling. So vendor sales income is important, whether you get an antidote from them on whether they're increasing or decreasing, um, whether you keep that information. I know that Oregon Farmers Market Association in general has good tools for data collection and they encourage data collection collection and they report it, which is a wonderful thing that will help you in terms of getting subsidies if you need them. It helps you to measure if your market's doing well or not. So rely on some of their tools and be sure that you're keeping an eye on farmer and vendor sales income. 
Number of shoppers is a key metric to watch to find out if your market is succeeding or if it's heading for trouble. So you need to be sure that you've got at least a stable number of shoppers showing up. That's what supports your farmers and vendors. That's your reason for being there. So if you are getting a sense that you've got a drop in shopper traffic, now is the time to start an organized count of those things. Whether you get yourself a clicker, whether you do a, a dot survey that gets people to check in so you can get a sense of how many people are in the market, whether you're just physically marking off hash marks on a, a clipboard, you need to keep track of whether your shoppers are increasing or decreasing. Again, like farmers and vendors, what you're hoping to see is a pretty good base of return shoppers. If you've got a neighborhood where things are changing and there's constantly people moving in and it's a real growth area, you may see a fairly stable number of shoppers, but new shoppers each week. If that's the case and you're not seeing return shoppers on a regular basis, what that tells you is you're not offering what the neighborhood wants or needs. And at that point, you need to start analyzing what can you shift? What can you do a little bit differently? Can you recruit new vendors that might cover categories that the neighborhood is missing? A lot of communication with your shoppers will help you figure this out, but it's important that you have return shoppers rather than just cycling through new people coming to check out what you're doing. Your market net income, we just talked about for a second, is a, a metric that you need to keep track of. If you can't support your staff, if you can't support the cost of your permits or the space rent that you may be paying for a public space or the insurance or the equipment that needs to be replaced from time to time, that's obviously a problem. It can be a bump in the road that you can get over through finding other sources of income, or it can mean that gradually you're heading towards having to close that market because you can't stay in a, a loss status forever. No business can. Um, sometimes markets are missions that are not technically analyzed the same way other businesses are, but most of the time at some level or another, you have to figure out how to support the operation that you're running. Your market is a business in itself. So recruiting new vendors to add to your stall counts, looking for marketing sponsorships with local businesses. Um, if you're a percentage market, doing all the things you can do to increase sales that will increase your income. But at the end of the day, your net income as an event, as an operation needs to be positive in order for you to succeed in the long term. Next slide. So there's a lot of different times in the market's life cycle when they struggle. Um, and some of those early times, the struggle is just functional. That's just how you grow a market. Week through, to, through, Week two through week, maybe 25, six months in, um, you're just, you're going to have some struggles. You're going to have some ups and downs. You have not firmly become a routine and a habit for your shoppers. You're still sorting out your farmer and vendor mix. You're figuring out which farmers are really committed. You're seeing if new businesses, maybe food making businesses that are in your markets are stable enough when they come in. Maybe they need some additional education. A lot of times at a new market, you're taking vendors that are not experienced in other markets because you still have openings for bakers where a larger, longer established market may not. So you're going to see some ups and downs with vendors that way. But on an ongoing basis, if your trend is that you're losing farmers and vendors, that's an issue. If your trend is that you're gaining them, that's a plus. Oftentimes you'll have a struggle in a new season if you're a seasonal market. There's just a, a situation that happens where if you close down for four months in the year, people are going to have to go shop elsewhere. They're not going to stop eating for those four months. So they're going to resort to grocery stores or they're going to find another farmer's market that maybe stays open a longer season that they can be comfortable with, or they're going to get food deliveries to their house. Um, they're going to find a new way to shop. And so the trick each time you start a new season is to redevelop those habits with people. Now there's some advantages to seasonal markets as well. The fact that you are, that there's a sense of urgency that you have to shop in that 20 week season and then you're not going to see those farmers again actually does bring people out to an extent there that's a, a psychological thing that people are going to come to things that are going to expire that they're not going to have a chance to do again it's why periodic sales happen in in all of retail but there's still in terms of keeping a loyal customer base uh, a struggle in the new season 
to get those folks back, to make sure that they've gotten the memo, that they've seen your flyers, that they've read your emails, that they know that the market is back and that it's time to shift their pattern again back to the farmer's market. You may find a market that's struggling from prolonged weather events. And this is probably one of the largest situations that we're seeing increase, obviously not in, just in farmer's markets, but all over. The weather is changing right now. And places that used to have a couple of rainy markets a year are seeing rainy markets for much, much longer periods of time or much more often than they have. Wind patterns have changed. We're seeing a lot of markets fighting with really heavy winds where they need to close certain dates to keep everybody safe. Um, we saw Mark, we post a Friday meme and last week it was Lenny Kravitz with his really big scarf and here we go, we're off into autumn and we had so many messages back either from people in places where it usually is autumn now who said, hey, it's 80 degrees here. We would love for it to be autumn, but it's changed. It's hot. It's still hot here. And then we had places where it should be autumnal and it should be pretty cool weather and the leaves should be turning and they're under snow already or they're flooding. They've got so much rain that, that their sites are flooding out. Their farms are flooded so they can't come to the market. They can't harvest. So we're prolonged weather events is something that is not controllable other than developing a new site, a, a place that you can operate when the, the weather is that bad. But it's something that's definitely affecting the lifespan of farmers markets and whether or not they're struggling right now. The other times you'll see a drop in shopper traffic is sometimes, but not always, during significant periods of national or local upheaval. So there's a lot of tension in the world right now over the war in Gaza and the war in Ukraine and infighting amongst our various political factions. And just a, there's a lot of heaviness in the world right now. And in some periods like that, you will see markets drop off because people just have sort of an underlying depression. It's hard to get out of the house. It's hard to even think about eating. It's, it's tough to take on the outside world. But many markets actually see an uptick in customers during those kinds of situations. And I, and I think we saw some of that during peak COVID. We've seen it in other disaster kind of situations. We in fact run grocery stores but we also run community safe spaces in most cases. So oftentimes when there's some sort of upheaval going on, if it's a uh, something that's happened in your area in terms of a, a tragedy or a, a weather disaster, um, whether it's national, sometimes we'll see an increased number of people gathering at the farmer's markets because it's a space that's familiar and it's a space where they can touch other people that feel safe. And it's a space that feels like part of their community and like the one spot where they can go to be uplifted, where there's no divisiveness, where there's just nurturing. And if you make your market that kind of a space and you make sure it stays that kind of a space, you will be fine in those periods of upheaval. You may see a weekend day that's a little off because people are struggling, but mostly you will either be stable or you will increase during those periods if you've made your market the place that people come to feel calm and to feel safe in their community. It's one of the, the things that makes what we do really special good work. Uh, next slide. So other kinds of challenges that can happen that are more business focused um, that you can pay attention to and that may predict some period of struggle is a change in location. So perhaps the location that you've been rent renting or that the city's been giving you to work has a big construction project coming up and you're going to have to move or they've rented the space to some um, larger organization that's going to use it on a regular basis. And that one day a week that you've been there isn't going to be available anymore. Or there's a road that's changing places, or there's a site that's been flooded out and that's no longer functional. We hear a, about a lot of that happening in recent times. So there's just a lot of changes in location. Planning ahead for it is key. We've got a couple of podcast episodes actually on how to change the location of a market, but it's always going to affect your sales for a little bit. So you can turn that into a plus because you're sort of having, having that big opening day in your newer location, 
But generally speaking, for a period of time, you're going to have a shift in your stability. You're going to have a, a somewhat lessening of your shopper traffic because people resist change. And because there's so much going on in the world, they may just not hear about it. It may take them a little while to figure out where you are. So a change in location may be beyond your control, but it can be something that you can plan for and mitigate the struggle that that creates. But that's something that we often see happen that affects a market and makes them stumble a little bit at a stage of their growth. A change in your neighborhood. Perhaps there's a lot of construction in your neighborhood. And so there's a lot of people moving in. That can be a good thing. It may come with big box stores. That might not be a good thing. Uh, it can mean that you've got a different demographic in your neighborhood, whether You've seen a neighborhood where the income is dropping, perhaps because a local industry has changed or because there's been an, an increase in unemployment. You can also see a change in a neighborhood where uh, income is going up. Oftentimes that's good. Sometimes it's not good actually for farmers markets. You may, we have seen gentrified neighborhoods where the neighborhood has shifted to a very, very high income demographic full of folks who have their groceries delivered or they have somebody else shop for them. And so they don't have that personal relationship with the farmers and the vendors and the market, and it can shift the health of the market. So that takes time to overcome, hold on to your locals that have stayed in that neighborhood, figure out reasons why those new neighbors might wanna come and be at the market. Changes in your overhead can cause the market to struggle. So we've seen a lot of markets especially in urban areas lately, that have had huge spikes in insurance costs. And that's going to shift how your market functions and whether or not the market can continue to be financially sustainable to show at least some kind of net at the end of the month. We have seen increases in equipment costs and the cost of things as simple as tents or traffic cones because everything in the world seems to be going up right now. We're in a period of inflation. There has certainly been a change in uh employment patterns. So oftentimes we're paying more now for staff. We see that as a good thing overall. We want people to be able to make a good living and feel secure and safe in their economic situation. And so we love that farmers markets are paying people more, paying managers better as professionals, paying staff better for being there, but it's going to change your overhead. So you're going to need to, to work that into how you're operating and make sure that you're increasing number of vendors or looking for marketing partnerships from local businesses or looking for philanthropic sponsors to help you with that. So changes in overhead can affect your market and can create a period of struggle. There may be changes in competitors. So if a new farmer's market has come along that is now three blocks from you, um, wish they'd talk to you first, does that really make sense? Who knows? It could be an indication, though, that you have a struggling market that you haven't recognized. So typically, the reason a new market comes into your area is because they're, they've determined there's enough demand from farmers and vendors to have an additional market. So if you didn't see that coming, let's pay more attention to what's happening. Make sure you're talking to your farmers and vendors and know what's going on. It could affect your business. Now, we have also seen markets very close to each other where they both thrive. Just like you can have four tomato farmers in a market and each one is healthy because each one is a little bit different, whether it's the personality that they present to their customers, whether it's the variety of tomatoes that they have, whether it's how fast they set up in the morning or how they price their tomatoes at the end of the day. Each one of those vendors is a little bit different and each market is a little bit different. So you can have a market open very close to you and still remain a strong, stable market. But if you're not aware of it and you're not watching for it and you're not maintaining communications with your farmers and vendors about why they should remain in your market, this can cause a struggle in your market. Maybe it's not another farmer's market. Maybe there's been a really aggressive food delivery system that has come into your area that wasn't there before that can cause you a struggle. They can try to pull customers from your market and they will succeed with a, a percentage of customers. Maintaining your good relationships with your shoppers, making sure that your farmers and vendors are actually talking to the people that come to shop, making sure you've got a good selection. Uh, those are all things that can fight that off, but that could have an effect on your market. Maybe it's not a delivery system. Maybe you're in an area that has never had a grocery store and now a big box store has opened and or a locally owned grocery store, which is an awesome thing to have. Uh, maybe that's opened. So that can cause you a temporary struggle as well. Long-term, 
you should be fine. If you're anticipating it, if you're working with it, a new source of groceries in your area means that people no longer need to, need to leave your area to shop for groceries. And that's going to be good for you. It's just like a restaurant that is only one restaurant on a street, four more restaurants open. A lot of times that first guy feels threatened. It's not a bad thing. It means that now that's a restaurant district. And now that's where people are going to go when they're looking for somewhere to eat out. And that's the same thing that's going to happen with your market. If groceries, good groceries, fresh groceries become more available in your area, your area becomes a place that people will stay in or come to to shop for groceries. So that's a, a temporary blip as long as you hang in there keep identifying your differentiation in terms of how fresh your product is and how much relationship you can build with the people that produce your food. Competitors don't have to hurt you in the long term, but there's something that you want to be aware of so that you know that you may have a temporary struggle through that. So what can you do to address any of these problems? Next slide. So there's some short-term corrections you can make if your market's struggling. If you've got a very new market that doesn't seem to be taking off, and this is actually where we see more market closures than we do at any other stage, you've got a, a market that's eight months old or nine months old. The farmers and vendors have committed to it. They're going to hang in there. They're not quitters. They know that they've made a commitment and they want to see this thing happen, but it's just not catching. So there's a few things you can do if it looks like your market is going to take longer to reach stability than where you are now. And this is a very common situation at the eighth, ninth, 10th month stage. That's a rough time for markets. If you can stick it out, oftentimes month 13, month 14, the sun comes out and things change and you feel stable and the market feels healthy and you're great, but it's really hard for people to get through that eighth to 12th month sometimes. And you'll see a lot of farmers and vendors resignedly giving up, you'll see market managers that say, I don't know, maybe this is a bad idea, we should close. I strongly encourage you not to do that at this stage, if there's any way you can financially hold on. So there's some things you can do at that stage to get you through that hump. Some folks subsidize market fees if they've got a struggling market. So if you can afford it and still cover your operational costs as a market, sometimes people will reduce their fees or they'll offer farmers free spaces or they'll offer certain kinds of vendors free spaces to increase what's available at the market. Um, I recently heard of a lot of people in our, our private group that were offering free space to food trucks and prepared food. This actually sort of makes my brain explode because typically what we see is way too many prepared food people applying and we have to limit how many there are because we really want to maintain our theme of being a grocery store in a farmer's market. But I do understand that if you're in a different kind of situation and you've got plenty of farmers, but you don't have that hot food that keeps people in the market, that lets them catch dinner while they're coming to shop after they pick up the kids from the soccer game, I get subsidizing that kind of person. There's a couple of things that happen with subsidized fees that can backfire on you. So one is that it's going to affect your market operating budget. You have to bring in those fees, presumably to pay for what you pay in terms of staff and insurance and site. Um, so that's going to catch you a little bit. The other thing is once you've subsidized a fee and given somebody a very low fee, it's tricky to raise it. So it's tough to establish that as a temporary measure. If you're going to subsidize fees, if you're going to reduce your fees, um, you may be looking at a very long period of subsidized or reduced fees. So you're going to need to make sure before you do that, that you have a plan to keep covering your operating expenses after you've made those reductions. The other thing about free spaces or very, very cheap spaces is it removes people's incentive to show up on a regular basis. They don't have any skin in the game. They don't feel a commitment. They don't feel like, you know, if they paid to be there, they have a tendency to have a rough day. My knees hurt. Maybe I'm catching a cold. I'm not going to go. Whereas if they paid the fee for the market, they're much more inclined to show up. And consistency of offerings of farmers, of vendors is what's going to keep your shoppers happy. So all of those things are tricky about subsidizing fees. And the other thing, frankly, is that most of your farmers and vendors, the fee is not what it really costs them to be there. That is not the block to whether or not they're making money at a market. If you're charging $25 or $45 as a space fee, 
that's not the biggest part of their overhead for showing up at your market. The biggest part is bringing product that may be wasted if they don't make sales. That's the biggest expense. Another large expense may be fuel. It's going to cost them to get there. Another large expense is staffing. So whether it's them paying somebody to be in their stall or whether it's them losing opportunity time in terms of being at the market between setup and the market and breakdown for four to six or seven hours, they don't have that time to devote to harvesting or planting or baking or bookkeeping. So it's those things that are the big expenses for your farmers and vendors. It's not the 25 or 45 or, or even $85 that you're charging them to be there. That's the breaking point for them. They don't want lower. What makes it beneficial for them to come to the market and continue to participate in the market. So before we would ever consider subsidized fees, what we do look at and what we have invested in a number of times in opening markets where the neighborhood is iffy, we're not sure we're going to be able to build a customer, customer base, is we've invested in subsidized purchases. Now, again, this is a big budget hit for a market. So you need to figure out how to do this without putting your own net income in peril. You still have to pay your staff. You hopefully are paying yourself. You may have to pay for rent. All those things have to be covered. So to find additional money, especially at a struggling market, to do subsidized purchasing can be tricky. But there are organizations out there that are actually much happier to contribute to food and secure people's food purchases than they are to contribute, say, to subsidizing farmers to be at a market. So there is money out there. There are sponsorships that you can look for. There are grants around. Um, some of those are tricky about subsidized purchases, but we're trying to educate more and more people in that environment, in the grantors environment, that this is a really strong way to subsidize markets and farmers and food makers. So when I say subsidized purchases, what we do is things like we always print market money for our markets. So they're just little script cards that you can use like money. And then we reimburse the vendors at the end of the day. And then we use that market money for things like giving a $5 market card to a kid that turns in a book report from a local school. Or we use them to just have a day where we say, we're going to bonus you. If you show up at the market, no questions asked. You don't have to give us paperwork that show that you're on a nutritional supplement program. We're just going to give you this $5 market card. It's $5 market card day at the market. Or we pass them out at events. We'll go to a community block party. And at our booth, we'll have flyers and we'll have magnets and we'll have shopping bags and we'll have market cards. Each one goes in a shopping bag when we give it to people. Farmers markets are wonderful things. Our food tastes better than, than food that's been stored for a long time in a grocery store. If you can get people to the market with that little bonus, oftentimes they will come back. Significant nutrition incentive program matches are another way to subsidize purchases. So that money, in addition to helping folks that are food insecure or struggling with their food budget, also brings more money to your farmers and vendors. So the more of that you can generate, whether it's through grant funding, whether it's through partnerships with local healthcare centers, whether it's uh, doing a Giving Tuesday campaign and getting the actual shoppers who can afford it to donate, anything that you can do to increase your new nutrition incentive programs, your market match or your double up or any kind of uh, program that's giving extra money to folks who need help buying food is doing two things. It's helping them buy food. It's also keeping them in the habit of shopping at farmer's markets. And a lot of times food insecurity is temporary. You may have people that are out of work right now or struggling right now, but who will be financially confident in a year or two years. If those folks have kept the habit of shopping at farmer's markets because you've helped subsidize that for the short term, your market will have long-term success. You will have built a really loyal shopper base that understands the difference in nutritionally dense food and, and not so much, that understands how much better food tastes when it's really fresh. So subsidizing purchases to me is one of the best ways you can help a struggling market. It requires some innovation. It requires some creativity a lot of times, but it's really the longest term fix you can do when you're not attracting enough shoppers and, and thus your farmers and vendors don't have enough income. You can leverage a bigger market if you're running more. This again is a short-term correction. If you're running two markets and one of them is very large or very successful or even larger and not necessarily very large, but larger and 
longer, it's been established for longer. It's definitely got better sales because it's on a, a weekday, a weekend day, and you've just got a lot of traffic there. If you have that kind of market and you're opening a new market, say maybe in a neighborhood that has a weaker demographic base or just a new market that's in its first growth stage, you'll see a lot of managers in those situations leverage the bigger market. So they'll, somebody applying to be in that big Saturday market, they'll say, I have a space for you there if you can also commit to supporting this Wednesday market that's new, that doesn't have a big customer base. The legitimate reason for this is that the folks that are in that big busy market probably joined it, a, a good percentage of them, when it was a tiny little market that didn't have any customer base. So is it fair for somebody to pop in and just sort of skim that cream off the top? Um, sure it is. If you've got a market that's growing, great. And you've got farmers and food makers that need the opportunity, perfect, put them in there. But it's also a legitimate way to have that conversation with newer farmers and vendors and say, yes, absolutely, come pick up on the, the traffic that these folks have built for the last eight years by showing up rain or shine and, and growing this big market. But we'd like you to also come to the Wednesday market and help build that. So that's a legitimate conversation to have. It's a conversation that you have to do in a detailed, specific way. Otherwise, you get a reputation for a manager that wants somebody to take a struggling market in order to be in your busy market. And that sounds kind of dicey. Um, and honestly, on a long-term basis, it is dicey. So if you're doing this on the short term, that's great. If over the long term, these folks that have come into the Wednesday market because they wanted access to that big, long established Saturday market aren't making money at the Wednesday market, you're not a good person if you're making them stay. It's uh, It just gets down to you don't want to exploit farmers and vendors. They're also struggling. They're also trying to make a living, trying to balance those numbers. You can't make people stay in a market that's not working for them and have a good outcome long term. But you can certainly ask them to give it a shot. You can say, I'd like you to commit to eight weeks in this new market. We'll also give you eight weeks in the big market. And then we're going to evaluate and see how you're doing in each space and how it's going. So we see a lot of people use that leveraging of bigger markets, especially when they're starting a newer market that doesn't apply quite as often to a market that's been open for a while, but has had a shift in circumstances, a change in location, a, a significant uh, neighborhood change. That doesn't happen quite as often, but very often with new markets, we see people leveraging with bigger markets. And you can do that even if you don't run a bigger market by kind of partnering up with a bigger market. We've seen some bigger markets that want to encourage smaller markets just because we're all trying to shift people to farmers markets rather than big box grocery stores. And you may have a, a market operator that's running a big market that will help you achieve that and, and kind of funnel some people over to help that market get started. And then partner activations can be a really strong short-term correction, whether you're using those to subsidize purchasing, like we just talked about, or whether you're using them to subsidize attendance. So you can do events that involve you and a bunch of healthcare screening groups. You can do events that involve you and sports teams. So little league groups and uh, other kinds of organizations that are signing people up. We've got some instruction that we've given on some podcast episodes and things. And I'm happy to share those if you pop me an email about partner activation protocols so that you make sure that the folks that want to come into your market that might bring other people with them, make the effort to bring other people with them. So you want to get them to commit to mentioning in two of their newsletters that they're going to be at the market on this date or commit to tagging you in their social media and saying, hey, we're going to be at this market this week. So you want to make sure that your partner activations benefit both of you, but bringing in folks that aren't necessarily farmers or vendors to your market, but they can bring traffic, can be very successful in terms of pumping up a market that's having some struggles with bringing in a regular traffic flow. So let's talk about longer term corrections. Um, next slide. So when your market's struggling, you need to, and it's really struggling, not that, not that you're in an evolutionary growth pattern. And so you're, you've hit that eight or nine or 10th um, month struggle point. That's not what these corrections are about. These corrections are about you're struggling, you're concerned that this market isn't going to make it. So this is where you're going to kind of drill down and look at significant changes that might help that situation. So marketing changes is obviously the first thing you want to look at whenever you've got a market that's not busy enough. Can you add signage? Can you disperse that signage a little bit farther from the market so that people know four blocks away that there's a market down the street? 
Can you make signage bigger and simpler and easier to see? Can you physically do some analog marketing, get out there in the neighborhood and put some posters in the local coffee shops and gyms and daycare centers um, and hair salons? And can you put flyers in your local churches if you're in that kind of neighborhood? It, can you put flyers in um, car repair places? Anywhere that people are sitting still and they're picking things up. Analog marketing can be really, really valuable. Do you have a local newspaper? National newspapers probably aren't going to do much for you, but there's a lot of still little specialized local newspapers that have really reasonable ad rates and that are inclined to help you out with letting you do a column on the farmer's market every week or letting you place an ad at a very low rate or writing a story about you and, and how the market is benefiting the neighborhood. Social media, upping that definitely helpful depending on where you are. Look at your own neighborhood, look at where they get their news and absolutely increasing your marketing and being serious about it will help your market. If there's any hope of keeping you going, this is part of your, your long-term correction. You have to jump into this first. It may be that the location is just not right or the location you're in has changed and the new one is just not right. Uh, we had a very... Uh, a market that opened with a huge first day found out between day seven and day 14 that the location we were in was actually uh it was owned by somebody other than who we thought it was owned by it was supposed to be the city they'd given us a permit they said we could go ahead it turned out it was owned by caltrans which is a big traffic bureaucracy and we couldn't be there after the first week so terrific Terrific location. Everybody loved it. Across from a park. Uh, couldn't be there after the first opening day. So we were we moved because we didn't have much time to figure out a location into a schoolyard that had a very high fence around it. And it simply wasn't a viable location. It was psychologically off-putting. It was hard for har farmers and vendors to get into. It confused people because it was down kind of a side street. Um, shoppers were not particularly comfortable there. We developed a very strong core customer base there, not a big enough one to keep the farmers and vendors uh, in business. So sometimes you've had a location change and it's not working for you. So you need to think, do you want to purposefully make a location change? Should you start scouting now for somewhere else that you can move your market? Can you move it to somewhere more visible? Can you move it to somewhere that has some foot traffic? Can you move it to somewhere that already has a built-in base of businesses around it? Some schoolyards are great. You've already got people coming and going in the afternoon, getting their kids. They, they're happy to, to stop and shop the market. But you may need to, at some point, if you're really struggling and starting to wonder if, if you're going to make it, you may need to look at what are location change options. And those can save a market. You can take a struggling market, move it to a better location, and all of a sudden bloom. I will say that sometimes in that case, you might want to also change the name when you move, because at this point, that name may be embedded in people's heads as the market that lives there in that location that, that they don't love. And it's sometimes easier to engage people in a new location if you change the name even slightly at the same time. Um, we actually moved a market from it was six blocks. It was not a big location change, but there was something about this side of that neighborhood and six blocks over. It was in a completely different situation. It was a higher traffic count just naturally because there were other businesses in the area. There was a parking garage nearby. Um, it was a, an area that just people felt comfortable in. There had been some history in the old location of kind of nefarious behavior. Uh, but we, and we changed the name of that market. We went from, you know, a North Park market to North Park 30th street market and just changed it just enough to let people know we're in a different spot. You want to come to the 30th street Thursday market. So sometimes that's necessary when you make that change, you may need a schedule change. If you've got a market that's running from two to five in the afternoon, and it's just not happening, it may be that you need to extend that to six. Maybe you go from, from three to six, or you may find that all the activity in your neighborhood is in the afternoon after the kids get out of school and you've got a market that's running in the morning and it's just not happening. So you may need to analyze traffic patterns in your area and you can add to that by doing shopper surveys and vendor and farmer surveys about what times of day they're busier at the market, but you may need to consider a schedule change. And that can be something that really turns the market around that's been struggling. Uh, you may need to look at product mix changes. So 
we're really devoted at this point in, in our evolution as a consulting group and as a, a educational group for farmers markets to understanding that all markets should not be alike. When I first started this, I absolutely was convinced that if it was a farmer's market, it needed to be majority farmers. And that's a still a wonderful idea, ideal in my mind. But we have become to realize over time that we also need to really take into account what the people in that neighborhood want. Sadrina Jalal, who spoke at our conference, she's spoken at the conference a couple of times. She um, helped develop the Farmers Market Anti-Racist Toolkit, gave a very clear presentation at the Intense Conference last year or the year before on the fact that you've got to understand your neighborhood, because if you were to come into her neighborhood and you're going to have a farmer's market, people are not going to be too sure. If you're going to have a farmer's market with food and they know that there's also barbecue there, you will get a crowd. You need to understand your legacy residence in whatever area you've opened in. You need to understand what's missing in their neighborhood that's not easily accessible. And you may need to think about adding some things to your product mix that was not in your original vision of what a farmer's market should look like. If you're going to call it a farmer's market, please have farmers. We are very much opening our minds to the idea that there should also be community markets that may not have farmers or may have a very small um, representation from farmers. Do have farmers if it's a farmer's market, but when you look at the adjacent products, do you want to have a section of art? Maybe, maybe you're in a neighborhood that finds that very important. Do you want to have a section of prepared food, hot food? Maybe you may have people that only have this tiny slice of time to get their grocery shopping done. And if they can also pick up a ready-made meal, that will be the difference in whether or not they can shop there. So you, you want to look at your product mix, see what's working, which farmers and vendors are thriving, which farmers and vendor categories are you seeing a lot of turnover in, and consider chatting with your shoppers and figuring out what it is you might add that would make it really valuable for people to come to that market. Another thing that changes things is some money. Um, that's typically true. So especially if you've got a struggling market and you see some ways that you can make changes that are going to help it, but you need to buy some time, finding some sponsorship, finding some local businesses that want to do marketing partnerships, um, finding an organization that wants to partner with you, whether it's a Rotary Club or a business improvement district, something in your area that will give you a little financial support to get through the rough times can make a huge difference. So when you're struggling... I would not go looking for these things if you're feeling deep down is that this market is probably not going to go. You don't want to engage in a partnership that um, someone invests in and then they, it doesn't last long term. But having a little bit of money can give you a little bit of room to breathe. It can give you some room to analyze what's happening and whether you're sure that this is really needs to go forward, but you know it needs to change to succeed. So look for some financial backup that will relieve anxiety, let you get back to being creative and not just feeling trapped or cornered or worried. Um, sponsorship can help you at this kind of stage. Uh, next slide. There are markets that won't work. Um, there are so many successful businesses in the world that have been started by people who have started other businesses that just didn't work. Sometimes you've just made a miscalculation. You thought or you were told by neighbors that they wanted a market uh, and they just don't. They're, they're in a situation where they're too busy to find that time in their week. Or there's a dearth of farmers in your area and there's just no way you're ever going to be able to get a committed base of farmers to show up. Or there's been a big economic downturn and it's just not going to happen. Or you just guessed wrong. Um, sometimes it happens. Um, we have definitely done it ourselves. Or we have done programs with or other organizations that said, we really want to market here. Um, we've made short-term commitments and said, hey, we'll do this for six months. We don't really think this is the right neighborhood for a market, but I've got enough farmers and vendors that want to take a chance. We'll do it short-term. And then at the end of the day, watching our metrics, evaluating what's happening, looking at the direction of either growth or shrinkage, um, we've had to come to the conclusion that this just won't work. And that needs to be okay. People close businesses all the time and your market is a business. It is a conglomeration of businesses. So you're gonna to need to have that talk with your farmers and vendors and make sure that they're on the same page. But there are some times in which you just ended up in a situation that has either changed in an untenable way or maybe you didn't think through a certain element before you started. And you have to admit that this market just is not 
a market that's ever going to truly succeed and that your time should be spent on something else and just so should your farmers and vendors time. Now, we usually start out markets, except for that six-month trial one by a county organization, we usually start out markets by making an initial commitment of either 18 or 24 months. And we say, you know what, do or die, we're going to be there for 18 or 24 months, however we decide. And we usually pick that initial commitment based on how strong our feeling is that all the right things are in place, or we're betting on a neighborhood that's growing, um, or we know that we've got a lot of farmers and vendors that are available, and sometimes that changes. But we usually look at a 24-month commitment, if at all possible, if we have some concerns that the risk level on some of these decisions is just a little bit too wide, we'll make an 18 month commitment. And we have never not kept that commitment. So we have opened some markets that have eventually closed, but we have always said, we're gonna give it a solid 18 months. Because as I say, a lot of times at the 13th or 14th month in the market, the sun comes out from behind the clouds and suddenly you're successful and suddenly you've got flow and you're you're feeling it. It's working. Everybody's happy. Every, the farmers and vendors are making money. The shoppers are committed. Um, I think it's important that you give it that much time. And if you don't feel comfortable giving that much, giving it that much time, I would suggest not opening a market that you're thinking about. If you can't truly say, no matter what happens, I can support myself. I can stay committed to this. I can feel it for 18 months. That may not be a market you should open. You know, if you have doubts about making it that far, maybe think about a different location. Think about a different market. Think about a different partner. Usually 18 months is a reasonable amount of time to see if it's going to work. So we usually, we do keep the initial commitment. We will go that long. If we can tell at 14 months, 12 months, that this has really been a struggle the whole time and it's looking dicey, we will start making those um Corrections that we talked about, short-term and long-term corrections. Can we shift the marketing? Can we change the product mix? Um, are the hours off? Should we shift the hours a little bit up or down? Uh, we'll start looking at what things we can change, but we will also stick to our commitment in terms of if it's not working at 18 months, we do not want the farmers and vendors to con continue to take losses or continue to do a minimal amount of business and spend time there that they could be spending somewhere that they're going to be more profitable or more productive. Um, we don't want our team to be spending time in a place that is a negative for us in terms of income or spirit. We want people to be in a place that they can feel like they're succeeding. So we will stick to that initial commitment. And if it's not working at 18 months, we will make a plan to close it. And, and we've done that, a, not a lot, but a couple of times. Um, we have seen other farmer's market vendors and other situations or farmer's market operators that have closed much faster. Um, and that's very, that breaks trust with the folks that you brought in to open your market, whether it's farmers or vendors or community partners. Um, it breaks trust with customers. So for all of us as an industry, it's not good for operators to open and close very quickly. It, it puts a bad taste in people's mouths about farmer's markets. It Building customer trust is absolutely your main predictor of success in farmers markets, and it, it that breaks that trust. So I strongly recommend not closing earlier than that. I, I recommend giving it a decent amount of time. But for us, um, that, that kind of 18-month break period is where we say, if it's truly not working, maybe this market didn't work. Maybe we need to, to direct our energies elsewhere. Uh, next slide. So managing a market closure um, is not necessarily fun. It's always sad. It is a little bit like that old joke about what's the best day, you know, what's the best day of your life is when you buy a boat and what's the second best day is when you sell it. Um, it's kind of like that. It's And we have a, I have a lot of friends because we work closely with the food industry and, and chefs and things. We have a lot of friends right now that have closed restaurants in the last year or so. A lot of people just powered through peak COVID and somehow made it and then realized once they were past that, that they just, their energy was gone, their money was gone. They couldn't keep going. And we've seen a lot of businesses close. We've seen some farmer's market vendors do the same thing. They somehow kept going and they've gotten to the point where they just can't keep making it. There's a huge sense of relief when you close a business that's not viable. And that applies to markets as well. It's a sad process. It's defeating. You get a lot of feelings of failure. Um, it's not a failure. We're talking about that in a second, but it's 
it's also a huge relief to not continue putting energy into a situation that is just not benefiting anybody. So when you're looking at seriously considering a market closure, one of the first things you want to do is talk to your farmers and vendors. Do you have a sense that it's slow, but somehow without communicating it to you, they're actually doing fine? Um, unless you're taking a big financial loss at that point, the vendors may surprise you and convince you to stay open. So every once in a while, we've thought, okay, this is just, this is, this market is tiny and it's, there's not that many customers, but it turns out that the few customers that are coming are spending a lot of money with the farmers and vendors. Sometimes those farmers and vendors have even said, hey, we'll take a fee increase. We'll do what we need to do so that the market operation can function financially. These are great customers for us. So you definitely always want to talk to your farmers and vendors first. <clears throat> Excuse me, what's that? This is a long workshop with no questions. You guys are usually so active in the chat. And so I can stop talking for a second. So <laughs> a little bit of dry throat. Um, sometimes when you're thinking about closing a market and you're not absolutely convinced, you can do that last ditch appeal thing. So you can say, uh, we're not seeing enough customers. Folks, if you want us to stay open, you need to come out. Uh, you can do a GoFundMe. I'm not a big fan of GoFundMes, but you can do that kind of thing. Um, say, we need some support to keep going. We'd like to give it another six months and make sure it works. Can you commit? Uh, will you buy market money in advance? So that's that's something that can help. You've got shoppers that will buy $200 worth of market money and they'll spend it over the next however many months. So you know you've got commitment from shoppers. So there's some last ditch appeal things you can do that actually sometimes turn a situation around. Sometimes customers sort of take the market for granted. They go once a month or they go every five weeks. But when they hear that if they don't show up more regularly, the market's going to go away, sometimes they actually start showing up more regularly. So sometimes it's that put out that dire message and tell them, we love you guys. We like being here. If you're not shopping, the farmers and vendors can't afford to show up. Do you want us to stay? Come shop. And sometimes that works. Uh, the timing of managing a market. If you're on a seasonal market and you decide your season usually closes in October and by August or so you're deciding that this doesn't seem to be working, I would suggest making it through the season. If you've already announced that you're going to be closing on October 15th, make it last to October 15th. Do that last ditch appeal. See if you can pump it up a little bit. Unless your farmers and vendors are truly struggling, I would go ahead and wait out the season. That can be a graceful point to close. Um, so the timing on closing a market is everything. You do want to give people notice no matter when you decide to close. So you want to let folks know, hey, we're this is August, we're closing October 15th, and this will be and the market will be closed. We're not coming back next year. So heads up. And sometimes that will rally people to kind of pump you back up. That communication is important. Get it out on social, get it out on um, email newsletters. Give the timing information to your farmers and vendors because they may have harvests and things that they're planning. You don't want to decide August 1st that you're going to close August 10th because farmers probably have things in the ground that they've planned to pull to bring to your market. You need to give them adequate time to prepare for the fact that you won't be there and either find another market or not continue um, sequential planting. And then we strongly suggest that if you're actually closing a market, that you really try to be conscientious about vendor and market referrals. So you tell folks we're closing, but here's a list of our vendors on their websites or their social media handles. So this is how you can find these vendors in other places. Here's a market that's 15 minutes away. And I know it's not as convenient, but this is a great market. Please continue shopping at farmer's markets. Please continue supporting local farmers and, and local vendors. So we always try to go out on a really positive note. Um, sorry, this, you know, we miscalculated this turned out not to be the right location or time or place, um, but please continue supporting your local vendors. Okay, we've got a few comments. Good. Awesome. So we'll get back to those quickly. We're almost done with slides here. So for next time, some, some of these struggles can be avoided by advanced planning. So there's, we see a lot of markets open because somebody thinks farmer's markets are pretty. Um, we see a lot of developers come to us and say, please open a farmer's market here. We're trying to attract new tenants. Or we see people that say, hey, our, our community needs a gathering place. We want a place to come listen to live music and eat. And so they open a farmer's market and they do that without really checking to make sure that there's a committed, consistent need for groceries. 
And that's absolutely key. So I, I strongly recommend that to avoid pain, you be careful about opening to begin with. So do a feasibility study. Look at what other grocery shopping opportunities are close to the location that you're thinking of. Look at how close the other markets are. If you're going to open a market near a currently operating market, think about a different day. Think about optimum timing when you open a market. So you want to make sure that you're opening when there's peak produce so that that first impression that people get is strong and they'll continue to come back. Look reasonably at your location attributes. If you are in a car centric kind of community, are you opening a market in a place where there is no nearby parking and people are going to have to, sh if they buy things, they're going to have to schlep groceries a long way. That's different than having to walk a ways to park. Make sure that you've got access. Many places are foot centric, not a problem. I haul a cart or a or a bag a long way. But if you're in a car centric kind of neighborhood, you need to make sure there's parking nearby. Make sure that your location has enough linear footage to put enough booths in to provide you with a stable income for market operations. Because at some point, if you're losing money, you're going to leave. There's a raccoon on my fence. That was weird. <laughs> um, uh, optimum timing is what time of year you choose to open. Uh, Buy-in from partners. If you've got Local businesses that are going to do marketing partnerships, if you have philanthropic farmer partners, make sure that they're in for the long haul. You want them to make that same 18 month or some reasonable level of commitment. You don't want somebody to say, oh, yeah, we're going to be there for you. And then a couple, you know, four weeks in, they say no. Um, our Little Italy market, which, again, is the largest market in San Diego County, our Saturday market, it started in 2008. Uh, we did it on spec. So we paid for everything. We took all the losses. There were no grocery stores in the neighborhood. There were a lot of restaurants. We opened with about a block's worth of vendors. Some of them dropped out. Some of them came in. Six weeks in, we were struggling because market's a six-week struggle. And the business association, which was sponsoring us and which was the nonprofit that held our permit, came in and said, we need to close it down. It's never going to work. It's going to be embarrassing. Let's just, just, let's just close it. And we were six weeks in. So luckily we had some board members that backed us up because we said, no, no, that's not how this works. You don't start things and stop in six weeks. Um, so we did keep going. We have an average of 20,000 attendees every Saturday. Now we've got six blocks of vendors. It's 180 tents on the street. It's an enormous thriving market. It's the biggest fundraiser for that community association. They bring in more money from the farmer's market than they do from anything else that they do. So uh, the long-term commitment was important. Make sure that your partners are up for that um, so that you don't have to go through the trauma of trying to reconvince them at that point. Uh, and that ties right in with have adequate funding. So make sure that you've got enough money. You are going to have, if you're paying your staff, if you're paying for insurance, if you're paying for somebody to spend time marketing, maybe for on ads, maybe on printing, you're going to need some money to open a market and make sure that you have enough. There's nothing more painful than watching a market struggle because they just didn't realize that there would be ongoing expenses. They haven't hit flow as far as being profitable or showing a net. And they've got a market that has so much potential, but they've just run out of money and they can't keep going. So make sure that you've got funding on hand. Make sure you've got a reserve before you start. Um, we strongly recommend staff and vendor training. There's a tiny little plug in that corner for uh, the Intense, the Farmer's Market Conference. Anytime you can train your staff, um, that's helpful. And we really encourage vendor training. So make sure that you've got the skills to give your vendors some training and some support so that they are making good decisions about their displays, about consistency of showing up, about how they run their businesses. And that will help you not get to this terrible struggle point. Next slide. We're almost done. So we'll have a little bit of time for questions and answers. We talk to market managers that are almost at the end of the rope and, and are probably going to have to close the market. <clears throat> and I talked to one a couple of days ago, and she said, I just feel like such a failure. You're not a failure. If you're not failing, you're not trying. People who fail at things do that because they're people that try to do good things. And so, the, I mean, the safest way to not fail is to not do anything, to just play it safe and keep a job and never try to support um, food insecurity or farmers or food vendors or anything else that you take a risk on in life. You're not failing. What you're doing is going through a process of an operation that seemed like a good idea at the time and has just not found its right place or time yet. Concentrate on what you've learned, concentrate on what you'll change next time so that you don't end up in that situation. But you are not a failure if you are trying to make a change in the world. You're doing good things. So we are ready 
for Q and A. So I'm going to um, flip through the chats a little bit because we've got some folks in the chat that have had some comments. Oh, there's one. So Emily says, our two vendors that are consistent in our weekday market are successful, but we can't get any more vendors to come consistently enough. So frustrating. We've tried so many things, but not all of these. Oh, good. I hope I threw you a couple of new ones that you can try. So um, who else has questions? And Emily, feel free to, to tell me what you have tried that hasn't worked, but um, but also hopefully some of the things that we mentioned here will will help you as well. I can pop on if, um, uh, our main thing is, so we're a nonprofit run by a board and none of our board members were mainly vendor run, but none of our board members vend at our weekday market. And so none of them care about our weekday market. So that's been a thing where it just has been a continuous issue. We've had a lot of issues. We've changed locations. We've, um, what for whatever variety of reasons, but at this point, like our, our board got really tired this year of us constantly trying different things and it not working. And they were like, all right, we're done. And I needed, I needed to have a, an answer about that before this class, unfortunately, because um, our ads had to go out for next year a few weeks ago. So I was like, I need a, I need a vote. And then, and, but yeah, we, I mean, we talked about changing hours. Um, other weekday markets nearby have done that and they weren't successful. So we hadn't tried that. We talked about it. We talked about another location change, but we just got changed. Um, and, but like, our yeah, we've had staff turnover. So that's really a big part of it too. But our main, um, our, we can't, for whatever reason, um, and I, I'd love to hear if anybody else has worked on this. One of our biggest things has been um, vendors not being available during the times. And it's um, usually um, childcare reasons. And like one, we've talked about like systemic like solutions to that like is there a child care solution we can help figure out for our vendors um i just hadn't written a grant or figured out how that was going to work yet but i'd love if anybody's worked on something like that like on child care for vendors i think that's my like a long-term goal i have we're actually familiar with a canadian organization that has child care for uh, vendors at their market it's kind of a cooperative thing. And then there's another one. There's a woman in Canada that has done a lot of work in Ghana and those markets all have a cooperative childcare booth. So the vendors take turns being in the childcare booth and then that vendor, the neighboring vendor will watch their booth. Um, it's an interesting thing. It's a little bit of a reach from what our basic mission is, but sometimes you've got to do what it takes. I would say if you've already changed locations and things. So are you planning to close next year? Are you not reopening that market? Yeah, so we, we ended up having to change locations um, before I came on, so I think it was in, it was either during 2020 or during 2019, we were forced to change locations. I think it was during 2019, um, our, something happened with the, our previous location that was really successful and the city just gave, threw out a location. And so it wasn't an intentional location is my mm -hmm. understanding. And, um, we, uh, I think that then it was closed, I think 2020 and I came in on 2021. So I came in to try to like keep this afloat and we did event. We were one of the people who does free food trucks um, to keep, to keep people, to get people out. And it's more like street visibility. We did ran events. We ran like a wine garden um, as often as our, the permitting allowed and that was really successful. And, and like the other like vendors who wouldn't come regularly, they're like, we'll come if you keep running a wine garden. And it's like, we can't do an event every single week. That's just not possible. So are you going to open again or have you closed? No, um, the board decided to close it, but I, we haven't um, present. We have our annual meeting coming up and I think we're going to present it there. And I mean, feedback, we haven't communicated it to the public either. I was kind of waiting until we talked to the entire vendor members to see yeah, for sure. a vendor yeah. membership co like community and so once the vendor so it sounds to me like you probably want to i personally just i mean it's a short description that you give them but yeah. i personally would say yeah maybe close that and take yeah. a breath i and think we'll so whenever you open it again it may work again but consider some factors and then when you do open it again do it under a different name That's because so at this point what's yeah. in people's heads is that that market doesn't work yeah. So, and so what we're working on is we're, we're finding a new permanent location. So I think we're going to like wait till we open the new permanent location and then try the weekday market again. We have a lot of other weekday markets that we don't run as well in town. So it's saturated. Thank you, Kat. Thanks.
Any question, other questions? That was a lot of info. I feel like. Is anybody else like in a should we a struggle open? market? <laughs> should we stay open? Should we close? Moment. What made you come to this workshop? And <laughs> your questions. Quiet, quiet group this month. And I, Kat, you answer so you have so much information that I can see people just being like everything's getting answered. <laughs> well, maybe so. Maybe I just talked longer and uh, and I've answered all those questions. But anybody had, is having a canvas market be safe? Hello, I don't know. I don't know if you can hear me. Um, I can. Uh, my name's Kelly Frank, and I'm in Oregon. And I just started one last year, actually. Um, so it was very, very new. Uh, but it, I felt like it was successful for the first year. And you, just to give you input, thank you for all this information. And I joined it this call so that I won't make mistakes and fail um, moving forward. So. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, absolutely. Hearing what doesn't work can help you do what does work. So hopefully that'll be. Yeah. Helpful. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Kelly, which market were you? Are you with? You said you just started. It was a little hard to hear you there for a second. I apologize. My computer is giving me some issues. So we started a market in Burns, Oregon. There has typically been one in Hines. Um, last year was kind of the first year. It, it was the first year that we did one in Burns. It's something I definitely want to grow. It's something I love and I'm excited about. I don't know. I just am looking for kind of ideas and where to go moving forward. I've recently found out about the Oregon Farmers Market Association. And so I'm just taking all this in, um, loving all of it and just kind of wanting to make it a success. We just did it uh, through, I think we opened it in June and ended it in September. So it was pretty, pretty short really, but Harney County has an extremely short growing season. So we knew that going into it, we had about 10 regular vendors. Uh, we have space for 12. We had a couple other ones come in and out, but all the vendors said they're willing to come back next year. And I've got a few more interested. I just need to find a way to actually, I suppose, learn to run as a business. That's great. It's not just have it be all my volunteer hours and, and really grow it, but um, I'm excited about it. Thank you for all of this. Well, welcome, Kelly. Um, we hope you can join more of our uh, sessions here and talk to other markets around the state and get more support as you as you go into year two. That's it's great to hear. That is good to hear. Yeah, Maybe. thank you. I'm excited. So much information. I just need to get plugged in. So thanks again. So Jeannie says um, we're not at risk of closing, but we've had struggles and are working towards rebuilding since COVID. Yeah, and COVID has been COVID has been a big lift. A lot of us have had to rebuild markets to such a huge degree. It's almost like starting new markets. But um, we've seen changes in leadership, neighborhood demographics, and overall social changes in the neighborhood. The presentation's given me some good information to consider moving forward. I'm glad. Yes, I'm ho hoping that helps. It's all you know. It's not easy. No, no business is easy right now. The economy has really shifted in the last few years. There has been a big change in farmers and vendors level of commitment to consistency, honestly, is, is one of the biggest things that we've seen post pre, post peak COVID. Um, I think a lot of people had sort of a reckoning about what they wanted to devote their time to, um, a sense of mortality that we all got or something. Labor force has certainly changed dramatically. And so that's affected farmers and vendors. So this is, it's a tricky time. And, you know, there's a lot of people struggling. If I can tell you one thing in this whole presentation, it's do not feel alone. There's a lot of people trying to figure out how to keep this all working. Pat, I had a question for you. You talk about the timeline of about 18 months to give a market before you close. And I was, I was wondering, is that a more San Diego markets open year round kind of perspective? And if a market closes, when you say 18 months, does that include like a winter closing time or how do you, how do you? Yeah, in my mind, it would include a winter closing time. And we do work with some other markets. We've, we've got a couple of markets in really um, 
very fragile areas economically in Chicago that we work with. I got a couple of rural markets that we work with. So we do a lot of kind of individual market coaching. Um, so yes, yeah, San Diego, it's really straightforward. We give it 18 months. It's a year round season and it's not a big deal, but I would say 18 months is also a good amount of time for a seasonal market because you will do two seasons because sometimes in a seasonal market, you know, you're just about to reach that traction and then it's time to close. And so that second season is really important to make sure that you've, actually achieved critical mass and that people understand you and you're going to have to ramp up a little bit again because you closed for a while and you're coming back. So I would say the 18 months is still probably a really good um, point to, to consider where you are because you'll have had at that point, probably no matter where you are, um, at least two, two seasons under your belt. Good to know. I think it looks like there's some more questions in the chat now. Um, Kat, in what ways do you incentivize consistency from vendors? We're in a small market with room to grow in our location. We allow drop-in vendors, and I'm feeling that our free structure and model does not currently reward vendor consistency. So we, um, some of our markets, we don't accept vendors that are not consistent. And if a vendor signs up saying they're going to be consistent, and then they miss a certain number of dates, they get the reservation canceled. And you really only need to cancel one reservation or two for people to other people know what's happening. Vendors all talk to each other um, once you make the point that you expect consistency. And we very much explain to people why we expect consistency, because shoppers have the alternative choice of going to a grocery store where product is not going to choose to appear or not. There's, there's always going to be eggs. They don't have to guess whether if they travel all the way to the grocery store, there's going to be eggs. So we, d we insist on consistency because we want our shoppers to trust us. That is the way to build shopper traffic. So we are absolutely clear about that. In certain categories that we don't feel are core grocery products, we do do some alternative week vendors. So we'll try to have people in roughly the same category, whether it's bread or um, granola or what have you, that can't keep up with weekly. A lot of times that's a really small vendor and they just can't produce enough to get there weekly. We do a lot of situations where we've got, not a lot, but we do a, a fair amount of situations where we have alternate week vendors. So this granola guy is here on the first and third week of the month. And this granola guy is there on the second and fourth. Still keeps the shoppers trusting us, isn't as big a demand on them. Still with an alternate vendor, we're very insistent that if they make the commitment, they show up on those alternate dates. And then fee structure wise, we have at our big market in particular, we've got, um, a fair amount of substitute spaces we have to fill just because it's a numbers thing. When you've got a lot of vendors, you've got somebody's going to be getting married that week and somebody's kid's going to graduate and somebody's going to be sick. So there's always a handful of, of drop-ins. Um, we charge significantly more to vendors that just drop in occasionally. We figure that it's those rain or shine every week, year round, if you're a year round market, um, season round, if you're a seasonal market, it's those vendors that have created the trust that creates the strong shopper traffic. And so people that want to just pop in, they need to subsidize that a little bit. So we charge them quite a bit more, which means we can keep rates more reasonable for our consistent vendors. And, and I think that's a very fair way to structure it. Also, so Tasia's market, the South Valley Farmers Market is part of um, Offma's research cohort. And one of the things we did find with our data from the um, cohort markets is that vendors that come consistently make more money over the year than vendors Absolutely. that don't come consistently. And not just because they came more days, their average, their market daily sales are more than vendors that come inconsistently. And they increase over the season more so that we could try to pull out some of that data from your own um data Tasia. yeah i love that i would I love to see that, your numbers that i mean that's something that i believe but i've never had actual data to back it up but i would love to see that data as well because it just makes sense the people don't come to farmers markets because they're the cheapest place to shop or because they're the most convenient or because it's easy to park there uh you know it's a it's a thing to shop at farmer's markets. It takes a little bit of effort. They come because of the relationship with the people that produce their food. So it makes sense that the more consistently you're there, the better relationship your shoppers develop with you. And of course, when they get to the market and there's two or three people to choose from, they're going to you first. So it just, 
it's a logical thing that if you're there more consistently, your sales would be better. Again, not just because of the number of days, but your sales minute by minute would be better. Um, and so, yes, that's another reason to, to encourage consistency. And explaining those kind of things to farmers and vendors can be really helpful in making them show up consistently. You don't want to, if you tell them you got to be here because I say you got to be here, that's not going to be as effective as saying, hey, you want to be here because you're going to make more money if you're here regularly. And the overall market's going to have more shoppers if you're here regularly because the shoppers will trust us. Got some requests for that video. I'd love to see that too. Please include me in that mail. <laughs> well, we are at 1130. Um, I guess we can. Anybody has a last question? Happy to take it, but it looks like we're getting to time. Oh, I see Sasha raised her hand. Sasha, do you want to ask something? Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yep. yep. Okay. Yeah. Um. Actually, what you guys were just talking about about um, possibly like letting vendors know that their presence is important. That's something that I've kind of been struggling to possibly do next year, especially when I'm trying to get new vendors for the market. Um. I sometimes I don't feel like it's my place to tell people who run a business like how often they should be somewhere, but there is a lot of data to support certain vendors being at markets only a certain amount of the time so but they're consistent enough we've just had a lot of inconsistencies so i've had people drop in more is there like a good way to approach possibly having that discussion with vendors that's like i mean i would just do it you can do it on a one-on-one -on -one basis you can also send out um vendor advice we do a lot of vendor email advisories it depends on your vendors you know how, what they react to best some people work best in a facebook group and some people work best at an annual meeting and some people if you hand out information it's good and a lot of times it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation and you can say it's not your place to tell somebody in business how often they have to be somewhere but it is your it is your market and it is your place to say, we've established these protocols because we know that it benefits everybody in the market. And that really is your job to each of those folks needs to protect their own interests and needs to maximize their own profit. Your job as a market operator or market manager is to protect everybody's self-interest and everybody's profit level and everybody's and your market's survival. And inconsistent vendors is one of the, the main reasons that markets struggle. Because the customers, if they're going to make that extra effort to shop at a farmer's market, they have to trust that what's on their list is going to be there. Because if it's not, they're going to make a second stop at a grocery store where they may be reminded that it's easier to park there. And there's only one cashier and it's um, it's open all the time. They don't have to, to conform to your hours. So you, you have to protect the shopper's interest because that protects each and every farmer's and vendor's interest. And just explaining exactly that to our farmers and vendors has been really effective for us. We've just said, you know, we don't want you to be here just because we want you to be here. I mean, of course we miss you when you're gone. We want you to be here so that the shoppers will trust the market and will feel confident that they can find you if they make the effort to come. And you'll make more money. I mean, is the the end result of all that. And so, obviously, when you're trying to convince somebody of something, you want to find what's in it for them. And what's in it for them is, as Amanda says, consistent vendors sell more because they develop stronger relationships with their customers. Feel empowered. I give you permission to tell people when they have to be somewhere. Would that help, Sasha? Uh, yes, I'm just not good at <laughs> enforcing <laughs> those things. Well, again, you're not trying to force them. You're trying to give them an opportunity. So if you can try to shift your mindset to that, you're not trying to make them do something. You're trying to give them the chance to be successful. So you're helping them. You're not. It's not mean to make somebody show up and, and make their business function better. <laughs> I know that's hard to get your head around sometimes. All right, team, if um, questions come to mind after we're off, as 
they sometimes do at meetings and workshops and what have you. Um, I'm at cat at farmersmarketpros.com. There's two T's on cat. If you only use one, it will not find me. So cat at farmersmarketpros.com. If you have a question or uh, tune into Tent Talk, we release a new episode almost every Monday. We did a best of this week. Um, and super early bird ticket sales are on right now for the conference for next March. So if you have the wherewithal and you know where you're going to be next March, this is a good time to buy tickets. They're really cheap. Um, oh, that's a really good idea, Hannah. Hannah says when um, sometimes when a vendor misses, I tally the folks who came to the info booth to ask for them. Yes. And let them know that that is super effective. I've had people, I've had farmers and vendors that have taken a break from a market. And when I'm trying to make sure that they come back, I'll say, you know, so-and-so, and sometimes when I got a name, that even helps. So-and-so is looking for you, or that lady that always buys apples is really unhappy that you're not there when you come back. So that, that is a really effective way. Well, thank you, Kat. Whenever Thanks. we spend time with you, it just seems to like boost everyone's energy and commit recommit to doing, doing this and finding that there is a way to make this work. There so is a way. It's a wonderful business to be in all together, all things considered and compared to other ways we can make a living. So um, you're doing good work. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for being there on the street every week. Thanks. I hope to Thank see you. some of you on Tuesday at our peer learning circle and then uh, workshops start again next January. Yay. Later. Bye-bye.